are you? Stephanie shrugged and managed not to wince. Her entire body ached. I'm good, she lied. Skullduggery glanced at her as he drove. Are you hurt? Are you injured? No, just a bruise or two. I'm fine, really. You don't have to worry about me. Stephanie, you jumped off a building. Yes, but the branches broke my fall. Every one of them. And how were the branches? A lot unlike pillows. You could have been killed. But I wasn't. But you could have been. But I wasn't. I'm not denying that you make a good point, but the fact is you could have been. I've already lost a dear friend to all this, and I don't want that to happen again. She looked at him. Are you saying you'd be very upset if I died? Very is such a strong word. Well, if you teach me some magic, maybe I won't get hurt as bad next time. You said you weren't hurt. Are you kidding? I jumped off a building. Of course I'm hurt. Stephanie. Yes, Skullduggery? You can be really annoying at times. I know. So, where are we going? We're going to at least find the doorway to the caves. Then we'll concentrate on finding the key to open it. Half an hour later, they were driving into Gordon's estate. Stephanie climbed stiffly out of the canary car and followed Skullduggery inside. The cellar was chilly and dark, and the single bulb hanging amid cobwebs wasn't doing its job very well. Countless years' worth of junk was collecting dust down here, and from somewhere in the dark corners came the occasional scuffle of rats. Stephanie wasn't scared of rats as a rule, but she wasn't too keen on them either, so she stayed away from the corners. Skullduggery had no such qualms. He examined the walls, scanning their surface as he moved sideways along them. Now and then he'd tap the wall, mutter to himself and move on. Is this the same as the way into the sanctuary? Stephanie asked. Are you looking for a secret passageway? You watch too many haunted house movies, he said. But are you looking for a secret passageway? Yes, he admitted. But that's just a coincidence. She pulled up the sleeve of her coat, revealing an ugly bruise on her arm, and covered it up again before Skullduggery glanced over. Did Gordon build the passage? she asked. No. It was included in the original designs. A few hundred years ago, this was a sorcerer's house. And he built a secret passageway to the caves. I thought you said the caves were a death trap for sorcerers. I did say that, yes. So why did he build himself a shortcut? Was he a stupid sorcerer? No, he just wasn't a very nice one. He used to drag his enemies down there and leave them to whatever creatures were hungriest. What a charming history. I can see why my uncle bought the place. Uh-huh. Stephanie moved closer. Skullduggery's hand was flat against the wall. He moved it and she could see a slight indentation, almost invisible to the naked eye. That's the lock? Yes. This is one of those good old-fashioned key-required locks. The kind a spell won't open, damn it. Can you break it? I could break it, but then it wouldn't work and we couldn't get the door open. I meant break through it. That would work if the door was in the same place as the lock, but things are rarely that straightforward. So we need the key? We need the key. I don't suppose we'll find it on one of Gordon's key rings? Indeed, this is not a regular key we're looking for. We don't have to solve a puzzle to get it, do we? We may. Stephanie groaned. Ah, oh, how come nothing's ever simple? Every solution to every problem is simple. It's the distance between the two wherein the mystery lies. They turned off the light and climbed the stairs out of the dank mustiness of the cellar. They walked into the living room, and a man in a suit, a suit that looked almost Victorian in design, turned to them. He had black hair and thin lips, and his right hand, which was skinless, glistened with blood and wet muscle. And before Stephanie could even register surprise, Skullduggery was pulling the gun from his jacket. The man moved as gunshots filled the room, stepping to one side and waving his right hand. She didn't know what he did, but it worked and no bullets hit him. Run, Skullduggery said, pushing her out of the room. She stumbled, and something moved beside her, and she turned as another man came at her. There was something wrong with him, something wrong with his skin, with his features. They didn't look real. They looked almost papery. She tried to hit it, but it was like hitting a bag of air. A fist swung at her, but unlike its body, the fist was heavy and solid, and it snapped her head back. She staggered, and it reached for her, but then Skullduggery was there, hurling it away. Three more of them came through the front door. Stephanie ran to the stairs, skullduggery covering her escape. 
Halfway up, she looked back as the man in the suit strolled into the hall. She shouted a warning and Skullduggery turned to face him, but it was too late. Purple vapor gathered in the man's left palm, and he released it in a stream that flowed into Skullduggery and arced out behind him and above, flowing back into the man's other hand, forming a circle. Skullduggery dropped to his knees, tried to raise the gun, but couldn't hold it, and it fell to the floor. Take him, the man said, cutting off the purple stream. Skullduggery sagged, and three of the paper men grabbed him, started dragging him out of the house. The man motioned to the fourth. You kill the girl! And he walked out. Stephanie sprinted to the landing, the papery thing clumping up the stairs behind her. She ran to Gordon's dark study, slammed the door, and pushed over one of the bookcases. It toppled and crashed, and books spilled across the floor. The door opened a fraction and hit the bookcase. Heavy fists started to pound on it from the other side. She went to the window, opened it, and looked down. Even if she made the drop without breaking her legs, she'd land right in front of the man with the red hand. She backed off, looked around for a weapon. The bookcase slowly scraped across the floor. The door opened wider. Stephanie turned, moved behind the desk, and hid. The pounding continued. She peered out. She could see a papery arm now reaching around, then a shoulder, and a head. She ducked back into hiding. One last heave, and the door was open wide enough for the thing to step over the fallen bookcase. Stephanie stopped breathing. She peeked out. It crossed to the window and leaned out, hands on the sill. Stephanie rose and launched herself forward. It heard her and tried to turn, but she slammed into it. Its heavy hand slipped off the window sill and dragged it through, and Stephanie reached down, grabbed its lower leg and hauled. The thing tried to reach back through the window, but it was too late, and out it went with a faint rustle of paper. It landed in a heap, and she saw the man in the suit glare up at her. He waved his arm, and she threw herself away from the window as the air turned purple and the window exploded. Glass shards rained down on her back, but they didn't tear through the coat. She lay where she was, hands over her head, until she heard a car start up. Then she got up, glass and splinters of wood falling from her, and reached the window just in time to see the silver car leave the estate. They'd left her, obviously deciding it wasn't worth the effort to make sure she was dead. Stephanie pulled the crumpled business card from her pocket, got out her phone and dialed the number. The call was picked up almost immediately. She spoke urgently. I need help. They've taken Skullduggery. Tell me where you are, China Sorrow said. I'll send someone to pick you up. China Sorrows was very still. She sat with her legs crossed, hands flat on the arms of the chair. The sounds of the city at night did not seep into her apartment. They were alone in here, the only two people left on the face of the earth. Stephanie watched her and waited. The apartment was vast, occupying the space across the hall from her library. Stephanie had leapt out of the car China had sent, run up the stairs and had been directed in here by the man in the bow tie. No time had been lost. Skullduggery was in danger and they needed to get him back now. China spoke at last. How can you be sure it was Serpine? What? Stephanie said, exasperated. Of course it was Serpine. Who else could it have been? A delicate shrug of delicate shoulders. We have to be sure. That's all. I am sure, okay? China looked at her, and Stephanie felt ashamed of her impatience. She lowered her eyes and closed her mouth. She was so sore. Her body was so sore. But it was all right now because she was safe, and China would know what to do. Everything would be okay. Stephanie would wait for her to make a decision no matter how long she deliberated, and she felt sure that Skullduggery would be safe and well. Even if he wasn't, what did it matter? China knew what was best, and if she wanted to wait, then Stephanie would be happy to wait with her. No, she said to herself, that's the spell. That's China's spell working on me. She dragged her eyes up, met China's gaze, and thought she saw a flicker of surprise. What are you going to do? Stephanie asked. China rose from the chair in one graceful movement. I will see to it, she said. You should go home, dear. You look dreadful. Stephanie felt herself blush. I'd rather stay, she said. It could take some time before plans are in place. Wouldn't you be more comfortable in familiar surroundings? Stephanie didn't like disagreeing with China, but she couldn't go home, not while Skullduggery was in trouble. 
I'd rather stay, she repeated softly. Very well, China said with a small smile. I must leave, but I'll return when I have news. Can I come with you? I'm afraid not, child. Stephanie nodded, hiding her disappointment. China left the building accompanied by the man in the bow tie. Stephanie stayed in the apartment for a while, but despite the fact that it was almost three in the morning, she couldn't relax. There was no TV, and the only book in a language she could understand was a leather-bound address book on a small table. She crossed the hall and stepped into the library. She passed a man in a porcelain mask, too engrossed in his reading to notice her. She walked slowly, reading the titles on the spines of the books, trying to keep her mind occupied. If she could find something here, a book that had what she needed, then maybe she wouldn't be so helpless next time she went up against Serpine, or anyone else. If she'd had even the slightest bit of power, she might have been able to help Skullduggery. Stephanie followed one shelf to its end, then chose another one, wandering deeper into the labyrinth. She couldn't work out the system. The books weren't arranged alphabetically or by author, or even by topic. It all seemed completely random. You look lost. She turned. The young woman who had addressed her slipped a book back into its place. She had tousled blonde hair, and she was pretty. But her eyes were hard, and she wore a sleeveless tunic that showed her strong arms. She spoke with an English accent. I'm looking for a book, Stephanie said, unsure. This would seem to be the place for that. Are there any books here on magic? They're all books on magic, the young woman replied. I mean learning magic. I just need something. Anything. You have no one to teach you? Not yet. I don't know how to find anything in here. For a moment, Stephanie felt like she was being studied. Finally, the young woman spoke again. My name is Tanith Lowe. Oh, hi. I'm afraid I can't tell you my name. <laughs> no offence. None taken. The books are arranged in terms of experience. These are far too advanced for someone without instruction. Two rows over, you might find what you need. Stephanie thanked her, and Tanith walked away, disappearing in the maze of shelves. Stephanie found the section she was referring to and started scanning the titles. An introductory guide to monster hunting. The sorcery doctrines. A history so far. Three names. Stephanie took the three names book from the shelf and flicked through it. She came to the part on Taken Names, a chunk of the book that went on for roughly 200 pages and scanned the headings in bold print. She turned pages, skimmed paragraphs, looking for anything that stood out. The best advice it had for taking a name was this. The name you take should fit you, define you, and already be known to you. She put the book back, unimpressed, and scanned a few more titles before she found it. Elemental Magic. She took it down, opened it, and started reading. This was it. This was what she was looking for. She found an old chair in one corner and sat, bringing her legs up under her. Her mobile phone was perched on the arm of the chair. Stephanie held one hand closed, trying to think of the space between her hand and the phone as a series of interlocking objects. Moving one would move another, which would move another, which would move the phone. She focused, opened her hand slowly, and then snapped open her palm, like she had seen Skullduggery do. Nothing happened. She made a fist, then tried again. The phone stayed where it was, just like it had done the previous fifty times she tried. How's it going? She looked up as Tanit Lowe approached. You're starting off too big, Tanit said. A phone's too heavy. A paperclip would be enough. I don't have a paperclip, Stephanie said. Tanith took the book from her, opened it, and balanced it on the arm of the chair. Use that, she said. Stephanie frowned. But that's even heavier than the phone. Not the book, just the page. Oh, Stephanie said. She concentrated again, flexed her fingers and splayed her hand. The page didn't turn. Didn't even lift. It takes time, Tanith said. And patience. I don't have time. Stephanie said bitterly. And I've never had patience. Tanis shrugged. There's always the possibility that you just can't do magic. It's one thing to know it exists. It's quite another to be able to do it yourself. I suppose, Stephanie said. That's some bruise you've got there. 
Stephanie glanced at her arm to where her sleeve was pulled back. I had a bit of trouble, she said. So I see. Did you give as good as you got? Not really, Stephanie admitted. But most of the bruising was done by a tree anyway, so... I fought just about every type of opponent you could name, Tanith said. But I've never been attacked by a tree. Well done. Thank you. Tanith dug into her pocket and brought out a piece of yellow porous rock. Run a bath. Let this dissolve. A few minutes in there, the bruises will be gone. Stephanie took the rock. Thank you, she said, and Tanith shrugged. I don't want to scare you, but this mightn't be the best time for someone to start learning magic. Bad things are happening. Stephanie didn't say anything. She didn't know anything about Tanith, and she didn't know how many sides there were in the coming conflict. She wasn't about to start trusting perfect strangers. Thanks for the rock, she said. Not a problem, Tanith responded. Us warriors have to look out for one another. Stephanie saw movement through the stacks. The man in the bow tie was back, which meant China had returned. I have to go, she said at once, getting up off the chair. She found China in the apartment, her back to Stephanie as she approached. Have you told the elders? Stephanie asked. Word has been sent, China said without turning. You sent word? That's it? Do not presume to question me, child. Stephanie glared at her. I really wish you wouldn't call me child. China turned. And I really wish you would pick a name so I wouldn't have to. Why aren't we going to the rescue? Going to the rescue? China said with a laugh. On our horses, is that right? With bugles sounding and flags flying. You think that's how it works? Skullduggery has come to my rescue. Well, they don't make them like him anymore, do they? Sending word isn't good enough. Meritorious has to be told. Tell him that we need Skullduggery to get the scepter. Tell him that without Skullduggery, Serpine will destroy everything. Tell him whatever you want. But we have to make the elders act. And then what? They call the cleavers to action. They call their allies together. And then we all go merrily along the war. Child, you know nothing about war. You think it's big and it's loud and it's good versus evil. It's not. War is a delicate thing. It requires precision. It requires timing. We don't have time. Not so. Time is in short supply. But we still have it. So you're delaying. Why? I cannot have chaos erupting around me until I am prepared for it. I am a collector. I am an observer. I don't participate. My resources and my standing must be secure before I can allow the uncertainty of war to crash down upon us. And what about Skullduggery? While you're waiting for the right moment to tell everyone Serpine is the bad guy, Skullduggery might be killed. The hesitation that flickered across China's face was barely noticeable. There are casualties in every conflict. Stephanie hated her. She turned and stormed back to the open door. Where are you going? China called after her. I'm going to do what you're too scared to do yourself. No, you're not. The door slammed shut before Stephanie reached it, and she spun around. China was walking towards her, her exquisite face perfectly calm. You have no right, China said softly to plunge us all into war. Who are you to decide when we fight? Why should you decide when we die? I just want to help my friend, Stephanie said, taking a step back. Skullduggery is not your friend. She narrowed her eyes. You don't know what you're talking about. And you don't know him, child. He has anger in him like you have never seen. He has hatred in him that you would never dream about. There is not one place he would rather be than where he is right now. You're crazy. He told you how he died then? Yes, Stephanie said. He was killed by one of Mevelin's men. Nefarian Serpine killed him, China said. He tortured him first, purely for fun. He ridiculed him, 
and he stripped him of his powers. And then he pointed at him. Did you know that's all it takes with that red right hand of his for him to point and that it's all over? Agonizing death, Skullduggery had said. Stephanie hadn't realized he had felt it himself. She shook her head defiantly. That doesn't change anything. When he came back, he fought Mevelin's forces with a single-minded determination not to defeat evil, but to have his revenge on Mevelin's lackey. Mevelin himself failed, but just as Skullduggery was in a position to claim his vengeance. There was the truce, Stephanie said slowly. And suddenly, his enemy was now a protected citizen. Skullduggery has been waiting a long time to get his revenge, and he will risk anyone and anything in order to get it. Stephanie stood up straighter. Even if you're right, that doesn't change the fact that he's been the only one investigating my uncle's murder, or that he seems to be the only one around here who cares about what is really going on, or that he has saved my life. And put it at risk. Every good thing he has done for you has been cancelled out by every bad thing he has done to you. You don't owe him anything. I'm not going to abandon him. It is hardly your choice. What are you going to do? Stephanie challenged. I am simply going to ask you to do what I say. Then the answer is no. My dear Stephanie. Stephanie froze. China looked at her. I've known your name since before I met you, child. Your uncle spoke of you often. Stephanie lunged for the door, but it was no use. Stephanie, China said softly. Stephanie's hands dropped to her sides, and she turned. Tell no one of this. Stephanie felt it inside her, and knew she would obey. Knew no matter how much she raged against it. She would obey. She had no choice, so she nodded as tears stung her eyes, and China smiled, that beautiful smile of hers.